right. So I want to thank you so much for having me. Um, like Manuel said, I am Jen Goldschmied, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the Chronal Biology and Sleep Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm so happy to be kicking off this series, uh, especially the psychopathology category, um, because there's such an intimate relationship between sleep and psychopathology, as you're going to see over the next 14 weeks. Um, so sleep disturbance is actually one of the core diagnostic features of almost every psychiatric diagnosis, which suggests that understanding sleep problems in the context of these disorders may help us better understand mental illness. And importantly, it may also give us clues as to how we might treat them. So that's really why I'm interested in, in looking at sleep, because if we can understand sleep, we can understand how sleep impacts these disorders potentially we can find new avenues for treatment. And we know that many of these disorders, either we don't have a really good sense of how the current treatments work or we don't have great treatments. Um, and so we'll be talking a little bit about that as I move on with this talk. So the focus of my talk today is going to be on depression. And to illustrate the significance of the epidemic of depression, I just turned to social media to get a sense of how widespread the problem is. Um, especially in young people. So this video that you're about to watch is from TikTok and it's the man on the right's response to the video on the left. So what I hope that you can appreciate from that is that depression really is everywhere. And it's especially problematic for our younger folks. So you can see um, that that man is really identifying with this woman's plight and depression and how she's feeling day to day, um, enough so that he wanted to kind of post this response. So, okay. So now TikTok has actually blocked the word depression. Um, they think of it as a trigger warning. Um, and so to get around that, people have to use alternative spellings. So the spelling here is just with one S. You can also use three S's. Um, and what you can see from that is depression is a really big problem. Um, so this alternative spelling keyword has videos with, with over 16.8 billion views. So what that tells me is that not only people are really showing that they're interested in looking at videos of depression, but people are also posting videos of depression. So we know that, that depression, again, especially in our younger folks, is a really big problem. So if that isn't compelling, I wanna share some statistics. So according to the National Institute of Mental Health, in 2017, 17.3 17 million adults in the US had at least one major depressive episode. And that represented at the time about 7% of adults in the US. That number has increased by 33% since 2013. Um, and depression in teens has gone up a staggering 63% since 2013. And I'm a millenna, millennial, <laughs> so uh, interested in, in the group of millennials. And that number has gone up by 47% since, since 2013. Um, and so depression is a really big problem. I don't think I need to kind of keep going over this, but depression is a really big problem. Um, okay, so the outline for today's talk. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what sleep looks like in major depression and how this might be able to inform our understanding of depression. Then we'll switch gears, talk a little bit about how we can develop a model that integrates what we know about sleep and depression to try to understand rapid antidepressant effects. And then we'll wrap things up a little bit by talking about how we can use sleep to develop new treatments for depression. Okay, so how do we define depression? So in addition to the core symptoms of depressed mood and loss of interest, which are really central, right? We can't really get a diagnosis of depression without having depressed mood and loss of interest that's pretty consistent. And depressed mood here, I wanna highlight, doesn't have to be sadness, it can also be numbness. And different people kind of present with different kinds of depression. Um, it's a really kind of heterogeneous 
uh, diagnosis. So it's really important to keep that in mind. So in addition to these core symptoms, we also see difficulty concentrating, memory impairments, appetite changes. And for this talk specifically, we're gonna be talking about changes in sleep. Um, so as opposed to what we see in movies where individuals with depression spend all day sleeping, which is why I wanted to kind of highlight this picture in the background, which is how we kind of consider most people with depression when it comes to sleep, there's a very typical pattern of sleep that we see in depression. So what does that look like? So here are two hypnograms um, illustrating a typical kind of sleep architecture from a healthy individual on the top and a depressed individual on the bottom. And what I hope you can appreciate from that lower panel is first the sleep fragmentation. So as you can see, they don't really demonstrate traditional sleep cycling that you can see Hopefully you can see my cursor, we'll, we'll see soon. So you can see this kind of typical sleep cycling in a healthy individual. You don't really see that so much in individuals with depression because they have so much of this sleep fragmentation where they're having multiple arousals throughout the night, potentially multiple awakenings too. Um, keeping in mind that arousal doesn't need to be specifically an awakening. So you'll see, you know, instead of this traditional sleep cycling, there's a lot more stage one and a lot more stage two, as you can see kind of here, if you look across one and two. So what you can also see is that REM, and that's indicated by these dark black bars towards the top of each panel, that occurs for the first time around hour two, which might be a little bit early for healthy individuals, but before the hour mark in the depressed individual. And we refer to this as advanced REM onset, and it's probably the most characteristic feature of sleep and depression. And what you can also see is that since traditional sleep cycling isn't preserved, individuals with MDD here also seem to have an absence of slow wave sleep. Um, so you can see that here represented by um, stages three and four from traditional R and K scoring, and that's just generally absence. So for the rest of the talk today, I'm gonna to be focusing on slow wave sleep. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background before we dive in because it's gonna be really important. Um, okay, so slow wave sleep or stage N3, if we're now gonna be shifting to using the American Academy of Sleep Medicine scoring, is considering our deepest and most recuperative kind of sleep. And it typically occurs mostly in the first half of the night, which you can see illustrated here um, by this hypnogram. So here's stage three, and you can see mostly in the, in the first half of the night. Um, so slow wave sleep is predominantly made up of slow waves or delta waves. So what, what are those? So delta waves are defined in, in kind of a couple of ways. We can use amplitude during visual scoring, and there you have kind of a, a minimum threshold of 75 microvolts, so you can see that here. Or it can be defined using frequency or how many waves occur in a specific period of time. And this is when we refer to it as slow wave activity generated using power spectral analysis. Um, and I'm gonna be referring to slow wave sleep and slow wave activity uh, interchangeably. They are different, but I just wanna give kind of that caveat. Um, okay. so. I already illustrated that slow wave sleep is reduced in individuals with depression. And the question then is why is a lack of slow wave sleep or slow wave activity important? So in addition to being our most recuperative kind of sleep, right, our deepest sleep, our, our most restorative sleep, we believe that slow wave sleep reflects sleep homeostasis or our body's ability to return to a steady state. Um, just think about how we regulate our internal temperature. If we get too hot, our body kind of cools us down. If we get too cold, our body warms us up. Um, and this is because after sleep deprivation, slow wave activity increases in proportion with the amount of time that we spend awake. So the longer you are awake, prior wakefulness, so if you stay awake until four in the morning or five in the morning, we'll see a greater increase in slow wave activity. So more slow wave activity on nights you go to sleep later, less slow wave activity in the beginning of the night when you go to sleep earlier. Um, so the first part of the night is suggested to indicate how much sleep pressure is present, right? So if you go to sleep later, 
you have more sleepiness and you need to go to, you need to have more slow wave activity. Um, and as you can see here, and, and delta activity is represented by this teal color, um, this, that slow wave activity decreases through the rest of the night. And this is suggested to reflect the recovery function of sleep. So as we sleep and as we have slow wave activity high in the beginning of the night, then we start to re recover and restore um, whatever it is that slow wave activity is, is representing. And I'll get to that in a second. And we need less of it as the night goes on. Okay, but more recently, slow wave activity has been proposed to facilitate the downscaling of synaptic strength. Now, this is gonna be really important for later on in the talk. So I'm gonna take some time to walk you through that concept. So as you can see here, and I'm gonna be pointing to the slide, hopefully you can see my cursor, but if not, I'll, I'll um, illustrate it with some, some points. So uh, as you can see here during waking in this red bar, um, as we interact with the world, as we kind of learn things throughout the day, um, synaptic strength increases. And that's indicated here um, in these bubbles below um, by the addition of postsynaptic neurotransmitter receptors. And that's kind of what we call an increase in synaptic strength, where there's more receptors to receive more neurotransmitter because those connections are really important. So later during sleep, and specifically we think during slow wave sleep, synaptic downscaling takes place. You can see that that blue bar dissipates over the course of the night. Um, and that can be noted by removal of these additional postsynaptic neurotransmitters, as you can see in this blue bubble at the bottom, right? So it goes from two to three and then kind of back down to two. Um, and that leads to this reduction in synaptic strength. So what you can see here kind of illustrated in a similar way is that as learning occurs, and I want to kind of pause for a second and say that learning doesn't necessarily need to be something that you're specifically learning. It doesn't need to be a new skill or a new word, but it's just as we interact with the world, we are learning, okay? And so as we interact with the world and we learn things, you can see here that there's an increase in that synaptic strength, and that can be additional receptors, or it can be a, a, an increase in these kind of weights that the synapses have. And then with sleep, synaptic downscaling occurs. Um, and we can see that in this, in, in this decrease in slow wave sleep or slow wave activity that happens throughout the night. And also we think that it's reflected in this decrease in synaptic strength. Okay. So slow wave sleep then is both an index of sleep homeostasis and may also promote synaptic downscaling. But if we ask this question again, in reference to individuals with depression, we may conclude that since they have a reduction in slow wave sleep, that individuals with depression may have impaired sleep homeostasis. Now, of course, as a sleep researcher, I found this incredibly interesting, um, but I had a mentor who is not a sleep researcher and she asked me, why would impaired sleep homeostasis really matter? And it really challenged my way of thinking. And so we then had to ask ourselves an important question. And that is, is impaired sleep homeostasis clinically relevant? Like, does it matter, right? If there's sleep, if the, in the background, individuals with depression have this impaired sleep homeostasis, does it actually matter um, to, the, to the depression or, or to their mood? So in addition to seeing a reduced amount of slow wave sleep in individuals with depression, we also see evidence of other slow wave activity ab abnormalities. So this graph here is depicting a slow wave activity response following a two hour sleep delay, which mimics the effect of early sleep deprivation. So I wanna call your attention to the red line, which is individuals with depression. Um, what, and what you can see is that not only do they have a reduced accumulation of slow wave activity in the first part of the night, so that this kind of first dot, <laughs> Um, but they also have a slower rate of dissipation of slow wave activity across the night. And that's true even if you hold that initial amount of slow wave activity constant. Um, so we were really interested in understanding if this slower rate of dissipation as an index of this impaired sleep homeostasis um, had an impact on, on mood or relationship to mood. Um, and so we're going to look at the relationship between these two things. 
So what we did was calculate a measure of the slope of the dissipation curve. And we did this by using a metric called the delta sleep ratio, which was originally developed by David Kupfer at the University of Pittsburgh. And that examines the relative amount of slow wave activity in the first non-REM period, kind of this for these first two points, as compared to the amount of slow wave activity in the second non-REM period. So you can kind of see these second two points here. So here, a higher delta sleep ratio indicates a greater slope or faster dissipation. So, you know, getting rid of your slow wave activity quickly. And we wanted to look at the relationship of that metric to mood symptoms in individuals with depression. And so we used um, the profile of mood states, which is um, a, a really nice measure of mood that can be administered at several different time points um, and is typically used in sleep deprivation research. So what we found was that a lower delta sleep ratio, which represented again, less dissipation, so a, a, a less steep slope, predicted more mood disturbance. So what we interpreted that to mean is that there was a relationship between slow wave activity impairments or dysregulated sleep homeostasis and mood disturbance. And so there's a lot going on here. So I'm gonna pause right now to review what we just kind of went over before we move on to the next part of the talk. So first, individuals with depression exhibit sleep abnormalities, including those in REM, like advanced REM onset, and slow wave sleep abnormalities. So reduced slow wave sleep and uh, an impaired dissipation across the night. Slow wave sleep has been suggested to be an index of sleep homeostasis, but to also promote synaptic downscaling. And we found a relationship between impaired sleep homeostasis and mood disturbance in depression. So I just wanna pause here, see if there's any questions um, before we keep going. Uh, we have one question from Kiem. I'm gonna allow them to talk okay. and ask the question. Let's see how that works. Okay. <laughs> hey. Hi. Okay, cool. Uh, so my question has to do with the graph that we just saw. So I remember there was a red line that started at a lower point and there was like a blue line that was higher. Yeah. So we talked about how the decline, how the slope is important because that's the decrease of the short waves or the slow waves. Um, but what about the difference between the blue line and the red line at that initial point? Does that matter? Is that relevant to what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So I think both are. Um, I was specifically interested in the dissipation to look at those um, impairments uh, and its relationship to mood symptoms. Um, but we generally see that decreased accumulation in the beginning of the night regularly with individuals with depression. And so if we look at kind of mood symptoms between healthy individuals and um, individuals with, with depression, we're going to see higher mood symptoms in individuals with depression, obviously, and a reduction in, um, in slow wave sleep. And usually those are correlated. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You got one question in the Q and A, uh, which is how can sleep deprivation help with depression? Um, yeah. And you can maybe, if this is too explosive a question, maybe you can answer it afterwards uh, in the general Q and A. I, I feel like I might have planted that question because it's actually where we're going next. So I love it. Thank you very much for whoever asked, and I will now continue. <laughs> Thank you for the segue. Um, okay, so. One of the other interesting findings about sleep and depression that I think can help us inform our understanding of the disorder is what happens during sleep deprivation. So what you can see here is an illustration of a depressed individual's depression severity scores. And what I'm hoping you can appreciate here is the relative stability of these scores. So it just kind of bounces along kind of the same area. That is until one night of total sleep deprivation where you can see a complete remittance of symptoms. And that is until recovery sleep occurs, then the next opportunity where symptoms rebound right back to their baseline levels. 
So most research on the antidepressant effects of sleep deprivation, and we've known this since about the 1950s, um, will find both non-responders and, and those who are characterized as responders, which we typically define as a 50% improvement in mood ratings. So as you can see, those who are classified as responders almost show a complete remittance of symptoms like you just saw on the last slide. Um, so our group examined 66 studies. Like I said, we've known this fact that sleep deprivation improves mood uh, for a long time. There have been a ton of studies that have looked at this. So we looked at 66 of those studies in a meta-analysis that we published in 2017 to really examine what the rate of response to sleep deprivation was. And we showed that 50% of individuals with depression will show mood disturbance, to, it will show mood improvement, sorry, to total sleep deprivation. Um, but the real question is why? <laughs> why does sleep deprivation improve depression? And my interest is really focused on understanding mechanisms of antidepressant effect, and especially rapid antidepressant effect, um, because we believe that if we can understand why these rapid antidepressant effects occur, we might be able to identify how depression is maintained, but more importantly, we might be able to develop new treatments that improve mood faster than our current treatments. So our current treatments, either SSRIs like Prozac or Cymbalta um, or uh, psychotherapy usually take four to six weeks and it can be even longer um, to take effect. Now that is far too long, especially with individuals with severe depression or those folks who um, are experiencing suicidal thoughts. Um, they can't really wait four to six weeks to see, it, uh, to see an effect. Now, sleep deprivation, we know, happens almost instantaneously. Like within a few hours of experiencing sleep deprivation, we'll see those effects. Um, so we really want to be able to understand why this happens so that we can develop new treatments that kind of use similar mechanisms. Because keeping in mind, we can't use sleep deprivation as a treatment option, right? We can't endlessly keep individuals with depression awake. Um, and that's not why I'm interested in sleep deprivation, right? I don't want to use it as a treatment. I want to understand how it changes the brain so that we can develop treatments that use kind of similar, similar processes or mechanisms. So in 2016, Christoph Nissen's group developed a model to explain why sleep deprivation might improve mood and depression. And they built on the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis that I went over earlier. So they theorize that over the course of normal waking, individuals with depression, and it's depicted here in that dashed line, don't build adequate synaptic strength to reach what they call an optimal window of, of long-term potentiation inducibility. And that's here represented in that pink bar, okay? So there's a period of time within the day where we can learn best, we can be like optimally um, sufficient for learning. Um, and they say that individuals with depression don't reach that over the course of a normal waking day. And that's why we might see these impairments in concentration and memory. Um, however, if sleep deprivation occurs and synaptic strength is allowed to continue building, because remember synaptic strength increases as we interact with the world with wakefulness, that individuals with depression are then able to reach this window. So we might see this improvement of symptoms because they're building synaptic strength. On the other hand, uh, with healthy controls here depicted in this dark pink line, um, if sleep deprivation occurs, as you can see with this dash line up here, um, individuals with the, that are healthy, then they sleep deprivation brings them outside of this optimal window, which may explain some of the cognitive consequences um, like memory disturbance and, and reaction time problems that we see during sleep deprivation for healthy individuals. So this is very interesting because it suggests that um, depression may really be an impairment in neuroplasticity, which has been previously proposed due to the very well-known learning and memory deficits that we see in depression. Now, my lab is really interested in slow wave activity specifically. So we reasoned that if slow wave activity facilitates the downscaling of synaptic strength, then selectively decreasing slow wave activity to reduce or eliminate downscaling should also continue an increase of synaptic strength. 
yielding similar mood improvements to sleep deprivation. So in order to test this then, we turn to an elegant paradigm pioneered by Dirk Jan Dyke in the 80s. So in this paradigm, real-time EEG is continuously monitored during sleep by technicians, and an acoustic stimulus is administered whenever delta activity is present. The stimulus is then repeated if no response occurs. And in this way, we're able to tailor this paradigm to each individual so we can significantly reduce the amount of slow wave activity they experience without decreasing total sleep time. And you can see in this image, it's actually our current setup in the lab where our speaker is mounted above the headboard um, and it's connected to our mainframe, which is outside of the bedroom and controlled by our sleep technician. So the question is, does it work? Can we reduce slow wave sleep? Um, and so what you'll see here is a typical amount of slow wave activity in the first on-run period in both healthy controls and individuals with depression. And following our sleep disruption paradigm, we're able to reduce the amount of slow wave activity by about 26%. Now, you might not be super impressed by that number, um, but we were really happy because remember, slow wave activity is a really robust homeostatic drive. And it really wants to happen it, during the course of sleep. So to be able to reduce sleep, slow wave sleep by 26%, we were really happy. Now, of course, we did see a subtle change in sleep architecture where we increased stage two. Um, we also see, saw an increase in stage one in healthy controls, and we did see REM decrease in individuals with depression. So what about mood? So in 2015, our group showed that slow wave disruption was associated with improved mood. And before that, in 2011, using a similar protocol, Lance Ness and colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison showed a similar pattern where depression scores improved following slow wave disruption. So this is great, but the real question then is if these improvements are really mediated by changes in neuroplasticity. The difficulty though, is that measuring neuroplasticity and specifically synaptic strength in humans is actually quite difficult uh, or impossible, uh, depending on who you speak to in a non-invasive way. So we have a lot of really cool methods in animals, but you, as you can see here from an illustration of just a handful of these, they're quite invasive. So you can see kind of a patch clamp here um, in this rodent. Um, so for humans then to be able to look at these things, we have to look for proxy measures of neuroplasticity and cortical excitability, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and this is the basis of my currently funded NIH grant uh, where we're looking at a total of four, including behavioral tasks of learning and memory, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, waking EEG, and TMS-based metrics. Um, so I'm going to show you some data here using two of these proxy methods, waking EEG and TMS. So waking theta activity. Theta power from waking EEG is thought to be an index of cortical excitability. And this is important because like I mentioned, it's almost impossible to measure synaptic strength non-invasively in humans. So we use cortical excitability as a proxy for synaptic strength. And we think that waking theta is an index of cortical excitability. And this is because it increases with increased time spent awake. A study by Plant and colleagues looked at activity in a similar frequency um, to theta and found that um, low frequency activity decreases following sleep. And that change is shown to be correlated with the amount of sleep slow wave activity, such that the more slow wave activity you get, the greater the change in low frequency activity from night to morning. And this would seem to provide support for the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, since it appears that cortical excitability decreases with sleep. In individuals with depression, however, what you can see or what you can appreciate is that theta activity is significantly lower than in healthy controls, as was suggested by, by Nissen's model but also that low frequency activity does not decrease after sleep and is not correlated with slow wave activity, possibly suggesting a decoupling between slow wave activity and the modulation of synaptic strength. 
So we wanted to examine what happens to theta following slow wave disruption to try to understand if slow wave disruption would increase cortical excitability. So this data was actually taken from a pilot study that we did at the University of Michigan, where we brought folks in for three nights following five days of at-home sleep on a predetermined 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. sleep-wake schedule, which was verified by sleep diary and actigraphy. So the first night in the lab served as an adaptation night, while the second was our baseline and the third night was our slow wave disruption night. We measured waking EEG in the evening before and the morning after baseline and the evening before and morning after slow wave disruption. So we wanted to see if it changed with sleep. So what did we find? So what you'll see here is waking theta power on the y-axis with higher values being indicative of higher cortical excitability. And what you can see is, although it didn't reach statistical significance, probably because of the small sample size was a pilot study, um, is that sleep does seem to be modulating theta power in healthy control. So you can see there seems to be a slight decrease from PM to AM, which we would expect with a normal night of sleep. And there's a slight increase from AM to PM, um, which is what we would expect again with, uh, with wakefulness, if there's an increase in cortical excitability. Um, but there's no modulation between PM and AM uh, during disruption. So however, in depression, you'll see that there is no modulation of waking theta over the course of normal sleep. However, there was a significant decrease in waking theta following slow wave disruption and a significant three-way interaction. So we were really surprised by this finding. So what I want to do is kind of summarize what we think we have for a little bit of extra clarity. So following slow wave disruption, waking theta did not change in healthy controls. So this suggests that the presence of slow wave activity does facilitate the reduction of theta and possibly cortical excitability. And this is because we know that a baseline night of sleep will reduce theta activity. And here we show that by disrupting slow wave activity, we are able to attenuate that response. So it seems that slow wave activity is necessary for that decrease. And perhaps this is evidence for the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis. Um, in MDD, on the other hand, following slow wave disruption, waking theta is significantly decreased. Um, we assume that disrupting slow wave activity would allow us to maintain synaptic strength or increase cortical excitability. So this was really surprising. So does that mean that slow wave activity plays a different role in depression than it does in healthy, in healthy individuals? Or perhaps that theta activity is not a, a good marker of cortical excitability? So these surprising results made us eager to explore a different proxy measure of synaptic strength or cortical excitability. So what I wanna do now is turn to TMS. Okay, so why are we using TMS? So TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation is an approach where we apply a magnetic field to a circumscribed area of the brain. In our case, the motor cortex, okay? So when you do this through the magic of physics, and I won't get into that, um, this magnetic field changes the electrical activity in that area of the brain. And as I mentioned, we stimulate the motor cortex, which then activates the neurons in that area and generates a motor response. And we're actually very specific and we activate um, the motor cortex in the area of the hand. And so we're able to get a motor response in the muscle in the hand. We then can use EMG electrodes, we just put an electrode right here, um, to measure the motor response elicited in the hand. And this can give us an approximation of cortical excitability. Since the more excitable the neurons are in that part of the brain, the larger the response will be in the hand. Um, so here's an illustration of how we do it in the lab. Um, so on the left, you'll see this is the coil that we use um, and that the little device with those spheres on it is our neuronavigation system, which allows us to pinpoint where the motor cortex is in the brain. And on the right side, you'll see uh, how we set up the, the EMG on the hand. And what you'll notice is that it's on the contralateral side. So remember, if we uh, stimulate the neurons on the left side, we'll get a motor response on the right side. 
Okay, and this is going to be a demonstration of a motor evoked potential from CMS. Um, so you'll see when we stimulate it, you'll get a motor response in the hand. That's the motor response. So that's what we um, can measure. And, you know, that was a pretty large kind of effect that you see in the whole hand, um, but we can specifically isolate just the thumb. Okay, so let's look at some data. Uh, I wanna mention that we're still in the process of collecting data for this study. So this is all preliminary and it really could change at any time. So don't get too excited. <laughs> okay, so to assess cortical excitability, we assess a resting motor threshold, which is the lowest possible intensity that evokes a consistent motor response. We then increase the intensity of that TMS pulse to 120% of that resting motor threshold to ensure that we get a measurable motor evoked response every single time. Um, so what you're gonna see here on the y-axis is the amplitude of that motor response. Um, and so here at the MEPs at baseline, um, you can see that they're about the same, um, which is a little surprising, but this is again, preliminary data. But then following slow wave disruption, what you'll see is that those with depression show an increase. And this is what we would have expected given the previous model. Um, it's an increase in cortical excitability. So these are really encouraging findings, um, but using TMS, we can also look at other metrics, including a putative measure of glutamatergic signaling. So this TMS paradigm is called intracortical facilitation or ICF for short, and has been suggested to be an indicator of glutamatergic signaling via increased excitatory pathways. In this paradigm, two TMS pulses are presented in rapid succession. So you get, kind of get bang bang, resulting in one motor response because they're given too close together to get two motor responses, okay? The time in between those two pulses, however, can be varied. And research has shown that when the interstimulus interval between the two pulses is below five milliseconds, the response is inhibited and smaller than when you would when only one pulse is delivered. When the ISI, however, is between eight and 25 milliseconds, the response is larger or facilitated. So one important note for looking at this ICF data. So what you can see here is these values are always expressed relative to just a test pulse or one single pulse administered during TMS, right? Because remember, if you just do one pulse, you get one response. If you do two pulses, it depends on the time. So we do it, we, we show data relative to what that one pulse looks like. And that's what we call resting motor thresholds or 100%. So you can see here that for ISIs here on the, on the um, x-axis, for ISIs less than five, the MEP remains under 100. But anything above five to about 20, it's facilitated or above 100. And that's what you're gonna see in the next few slides. Now, this facilitation that you see is suggested to be dependent on glutamatergic signaling. And this is because when NMDA receptor antagonists are administered, this facilitation is eliminated. So here you can see the effects of two NMDA receptor antagonists. Rylazole is in the open circles on the left and mementine is in the closed circle on the right. And what you can see is that both of these compounds show a blunted ICF. So all of their values stay under 100. So the question that we wanted to ask is what ICF looks like in our participants before and after slow wave disruption. So if slow wave activity really does facilitate changes in synaptic strength, as has been suggested by the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, we would expect that ICF as an index of glutamatergic signaling will be altered since changes in synaptic strength should be paralleled by changes in glutamatergic signaling. So first, just as a manipulation check, we wanted to look at the test pulse, which was administered at 120% of resting motor threshold. So remember, a test pulse is just one pulse. And here we see the same pattern of results that we saw with the MEPs. Um, individuals with MDD show an increase in cortical excitability, and here um, the healthy controls actually show a decrease. So let's look at ICF. So first, let, let me orient you to the graph. 
So on the x-axis here, you're going to see the inner stimulus intervals that we used in the study. So this is 4, 5, 8, 10, 15, and 20. On the y-axis, you're going to see the relative MEP amplitude. And we do this, again, because I mentioned that facilitation is relative to what the motor response would be with just one single pulse. And that's going to be denoted here by 100. So facilitation would be seen with any value over 100. And as a reminder, ISIs up to five milliseconds typically inhibit the motor response, and ISIs greater than about eight milliseconds facilitate that response. So first, the healthy controls at baseline show a very standard ICF response, with ISIs of 10, 15, and 20 showing a reliable facilitation. And we think that's supported by glutamatergic signaling. So for the next few, I want to make it easier to visualize the remaining results. So I've adjusted the axis. So we're going to have a minimum of 100. And we're looking at ISIs above 8, which should facilitate the excitability. So we've already seen the healthy controls at baseline, which I just presented. Following slow wave disruption, we then see a slight increase in facilitation up until about 20 milliseconds, which is usually where we potentially have a maximum plateau. So it seems that slow wave disruption does serve to increase cortical excitability, as we may have expected, um, potentially due to increased excitatory pathways. But what about MDD? So remarkably, at baseline, those with MDD actually resemble healthy controls following slow wave disruption. And, they, and following slow wave disruption, they show a decrease in this excitability and more closely resemble healthy controls at baseline. So perhaps this is reflecting a normalizing effect of slow wave disruption. Um, so this was surprising. So what was our takeaway from these data? So just the TMS summary in total. So slow wave disruption seems to increase cortical excitability as assessed by motor evoked potentials, but slow wave disruption may also decrease glutamate mediated connectivity. Um, so again, this was kind of surprising. So I want to kind of pull all of the results that we've seen together into context. So slow wave sleep and slow wave activity is reduced in those with depression, and this reduction is associated with mood impairments. According to the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, slow wave activity is hypothesized to facilitate synaptic downscaling. The synaptic plasticity model of therapeutic sleep deprivation suggests that sleep that synaptic strength is deficient in, in individuals with depression, and that sleep deprivation improves the mood by increasing cortical excitability to healthy levels. Now, slow wave disruption, we know, improves mood, and it may do so by increasing cortical excitability. We saw some evidence of that in the motor evoked potentials. But what does it mean that ICF and waking theta activity actually decreased following slow wave disruption? We, we don't know the answers to those questions just yet. Um, and it, what's nice is that we can uh, look at some of these other proxy measures, which is what we're doing in that study. So I already presented the, the TMS data from the current grant um, and waking EEG from our previous pilot project. And we're going to be hoping to replicate some of those findings in our current study that we're doing now. So we're currently wrapping up recruitment on this study, and we're going to be eager to look at the data from from the other proxy measures. So that includes brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And BDNF is a downstream marker of plasticity. We measure it using peripheral blood. Now, it's not an ideal proxy measure because there's the blood-brain barrier. Um, but BDNF has shown differences in those with depression and has been shown to be normalized following antidepressant treatment. So whether or not BDNF is a good proxy measure of synaptic plasticity or cortical uh, excitability, we're not sure, but we do know that it's different in depression and normalizes after treatment. So we're gonna look at it. We also have behavioral measures of learning and memory, such as the NBAC task depicted here, which is a measure of nonverbal memory. Um, also, you know, synaptic strength is implicated in learning. And so if there are changes in synaptic strength, we may see it reflected in, in measures of learning and memory. Now, there are, of course, differences in long-term and short-term synaptic plasticity. So this is kind of an open question. Um, what are some other future directions? So in the last several years, researchers have also identified ways to enhance slow wave activity. 
which interestingly uses the same kind of auditory stimulation that we use in the current study, except they use a closed loop paradigm where they're able to provoke this, this uh, auditory stimulation during very specific points of a slow oscillation, which seems to subsequently enhance future slow waves. Um, so slow wave enhancement has been shown to improve memory retention and improve memory function. But for us, the question is open, would it worsen mood in depression if slow wave activity really is depressogenic, would it worsen mood? Or can we use it to improve mood by stimulating maybe perhaps only in the first half of the night? So here's a snapshot of two devices that are currently on the market. Um, so just by wearing kind of these headbands, you can increase your deep sleep. Um, but an interesting development is that over the past several months, both of these devices have actually been discontinued. Um, so Philips Respironics is the one on the bottom, and they've cited the fact that they had this CPAP recall and they really needed to reorganize their, their business model to only focus on CPAPs. So they've discontinued these items, but we don't, we don't really know exactly what's going on, but it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, now, a question that I get all the time um, and I wanna mention is a new direction in depression treatment um, which is ketamine and other psychedelics. So ketamine is a compound that also results in rapid antidepressant effects. And what has been shown is that following ketamine administration, BDNF and slow wave activity increase. So psilocybin is another psychedelic compound which has shown promise as a rapid antidepressant treatment. But here we can see a decrease in slow wave activity. Now, this study, however, was conducted in healthy individuals, so we don't actually know how it would you know, result in individuals with depression. Um, but as you can see, slow wave activity is altered with the use of both of these agents. So we're really eager to further examine you know, both or, or one of these compounds. We just submitted a new grant proposal to study the effects of ketamine on slow wave activity. So hopefully we'll have some more, well, hopefully it'll be funded. And then hopefully we'll have a, a few more answers in, in a few years. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank all of the truly exceptional people that I've been fortunate to work with both at the University of Michigan and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'd also like to thank our funding sources and all of the individuals who, who volunteered to participate in our studies. Uh, those two photos of, are of the, uh, the students in my lab. A lot of the work um, I wanna point out for the TMS was led by a really talented undergrad, Sam Costello. Um, and so I wanna give her all the credit for it. Uh, and I wanna thank you all for your attention. Uh, hopefully you found this interesting and, and appreciate uh, the, the interest and the importance of slow wave activity. Thank you so much. <laughs>